we know that bargain, uh, healthcare is a topic of discussion at every single bargaining table and every single union shop. Um, and everyone is seeing their costs go up. Opponents to Medicare for All stand ready to use fear mongering to pit workers against it, much like Joe Biden did in the presidential primary. Instead, advocates of Medicare for All must acknowledge the impact on jobs and must fight for a robust just transition for impacted workers. Um, it, it's something that that Canadians hold pretty dear to them. Uh, they are they are really comfortable with the fact that the judge and the janitor get the same health care when they walk in through the hospital doors. Um, they like to know that their neighbors are covered. They like to know that you know it, it is a it is a social safety net. That, that people uh, really, really are attached to. And in fact, it's political suicide for any, any, any party in Canada to, to run on try, talking about uh, eliminating our, uh, our healthcare system, our public healthcare system. We will not, we will not get single payer healthcare without the help and without the engagement, meaningful engagement of the American labor movement. Um, one of the reasons that we have are having this um, presentation is, you know, in order to get single payer passed in this country, we have to read, uh, reach a critical mass of active supporters. And that means people who are willing to do more than just um, read an email. And in order to do that, um, you know, we really need the help of unions and other organized groups to join in with us to get this job done. And so we wanted to concentrate on um, the unions and where they're um, where they were on this issue, what their concerns were, what they liked about it, and, and what they need and what they need from us in order to um, become, you know, to get active in this um, fight to get single payer and healthcare justice. Um, and, you know, and that's the reason why we need to get at least about three and a half percent of the public actively involved. That means people that will call their representatives and put pressure on them. We have to have enough people doing that, that their, our elected officials realize that we can affect changes in their election. And we can, um, you know, put that pressure on and that we're a large group. You know, if there's 10 of us that make phone calls and it's always the same 10, it doesn't have the same effect as if there's a couple hundred of us that are doing that. And so that's... Um, you know, one of the reasons is we need to build that critical mass of people that are supporting this in an active manner. And, um, you know, we need the unions, we need the faith community, we need the health community, and we need other social justice groups to join in. And, um, and that, so we'd like to, to look at each one of those um, sectors and, and get them involved, while also allowing people to you know, in those groups to um, keep their individuality and their individual missions. And that's kind of an important thing as well um, and stuff. So that's one of the reasons that we're doing this. And it's also for education so that um, people can learn more about single payer and how it works. Um, I'm going to um, direct everyone's attention to Deb Klein, who is the executive director for Cleveland Jobs with Justice. And she's also the president of her union and in charge of negotiations, a fun activity that um, I can attest to <laughs> in that. So Deb, go ahead. Um, thanks, Deb. Um, good morning, everyone. As, as Deb said, I am the, the director of Cleveland Jobs with Justice and also the president of OPEIU Local 1794. Um, and healthcare is... Uh, is a topic that is very important to me. Um, and just really quickly, my own personal experience with the wonderful healthcare system here um, in the United States, when I started in my position, which was just 14 years ago, my healthcare premiums per month were $450. And they've now skyrocketed up to almost $1,600. Um, so 
that that's a huge increase and I'm fairly healthy. Um, so it's ridiculous what's help it happening to our healthcare system here in the United States. And I think it's very important um, that we have a single payer um, Medicare for all system in the US. Um, so just a little technical to let everyone know, <clears throat> as you know, you are all muted. Um, and when we get done with the, the three presenters, we're going to open up for questions. If you could raise your hand and I will call on you. The way that you raise your hand, if you've updated your Zoom recently, you go down to the reactions button, they finally have put a raised hand down the reactions button. Um, if you have not updated, then you still have to go back to the participants and you click on the participants icon and you'll see the raised hand feature. Um, <clears throat> and we will also take questions in the chat. So if you have questions as we're going along, you can put them in the chat and I'll be watching those. So welcome to everyone. And I'm going to introduce our three speakers and then we'll start with Rhiannon. Rihanna Durye is the national, the new national coordinator of the Labor Campaign for Single Payer. Welcome. Um, Rihanna has dedicated her career to advancing the rights of workers and building a broader, bolder, and more inclusive labor movement. Um, she was the youngest ever political director of the Denver Area Labor Federation. She led efforts to expand access to collective bargaining for public workers, minimum wage increases for Colorado workers and dramatically increased member participation in legislative and electoral programs. Rhiannon could not have joined in a more crucial time. A new Congress is in town and the Medicare for All Act was introduced in the House on March 17th, as we all know. We are working to recruit co-sponsors and sign up in endorsers. Um, our next speaker is Katha, Katha Fourier. She's from Canada. Um, Katha was Unifor's first Ontario Regional Director before being appointed Assistant to the National President in 2016. Katha was born and raised in Northern Ontario. Her father was a proud member of CEP, one of Unifor's founding unions, along with the CAW at the Dom Tar Mill in Red Rock. Um, she's worked several years in small rural in, in a small rural hospital in Ontario. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Because I would slaughter it. Um, I think it's, is it Nipigon, Ontario? All right, we got it. And held various positions representing workers in the workplace. Um, she's been a member of Unifor Local 229 in Thunder Bay. She was vice president before going on staff of the CAW in Windsor. Uh, and Catherine Isaac. Catherine Isaac is the executive director of the Debs Jones Douglas Institute, where she advocates for Medicare for All. Previously, she coordinated the campaign for postal banking in a grand alliance to save our postal service at the American Postal Workers Union. I had the pleasure of working with Catherine on that campaign and miss her a lot. Um, her labor movement work also includes the Oil, Chemical and Atomic Workers Union in its effort to create a labor party. She currently, currently serves as treasurer of the International Labor Rights Forum, and she is the author of Civics for Democracy, A Journey for Teachers and Students. So we are going to begin with Rhiannon. Rhiannon, if you could go and remember, I will give you a one minute warning. <clears throat> Great, thank you so much for the introduction, Deb. Uh, so uh, my name is Rhiannon. I'm the national coordinator for the Labor Campaign for Single Payer. And uh, just wanna spend a little bit of time with you guys um, uh, talking about Labor, working with labor unions and building um, uh, support and participation for uh, single payer healthcare activism within the labor movement because it can be it can be a tough thing to do, but it is um, critically important. You know, uh, with uh, the pandemic hopefully coming to a close, um, uh, but uh, union members, workers, Americans, um, all still feeling, uh, you know, the pain and the hurt of that. Uh, we find ourselves in a really prime opportunity to do some movement building. And uh, labor unions and their members um, uh, are one of the only bodies that with the social weight and resources to pose a serious threat to the for-profit healthcare industry. 
you know, the power wielded by a meaningfully engaged and educated membership is going to be um, the response that we need to corporate interests that have managed to wield their bipartisan influence to block any substantial pro-worker uh, single-payer healthcare legislation. Um, so before we dive into how to effectively engage um, labor unions, I wanted to talk a little bit about why you see some opposition um, within the labor movement. Because uh, it's important to, I think, to understand uh, um, uh, where people are coming from. And so you uh, will see that uh, there are many unions that um, support single payer health care, uh, pass resolutions in support of it, don't take a lot of action on it, though, however. Um, I would say that is the vast majority of, uh, of unions, both at the local level and at um, the national level. Uh, and, but then, uh, Kate, you do also have uh, um, the unions who will actively oppose it and will actively oppose legislation, whether it's proposed at the state level um, or at the national level. And uh, Fundamentally, they are doing what they believe is best for their membership and what and what they believe that they are hearing from their membership um, on this particular issue. Obviously, like we um, here in this space disagree with that assessment, but um, uh, you know the the opposition is uh, is because they want to do right by their members and protect the benefits that they, have fought for and um, earned. So it can feel. I think it can feel spiteful, and you know, in in these um, uh, in these battles where you know we've been fighting for on this issue for years. I, folks have been involved in the movement for decades. Um, it can feel very that opposition can feel very personal, and I think it's important to continue to remember to continue to step back from that. Um, uh, and know that it isn't personal. It's the labor leaders um, trying to do right by their members. Um, it is all, it also it's complicated um, with the different types of benefit systems that have been set up um, through Taft Hartley funds for some unions, um, uh, and how the member and how benefits are uh, distributed and to their membership. Um, uh, both at, while they're working and after they're retired. There are some legitimate questions and concerns that people have uh, about what happens to Taft-Hartley benefit funds uh, once single payer passes. And uh, the, these funds involve a lot, a lot of money. And uh, uh, so when uh, there's not a solid answer to what happens to the, uh, those funds, uh, you know, it it gives people a lot of pause. We know that bargain, uh, healthcare is a topic of discussion at every single bargaining table, at every single union shop, um, and everyone is seeing their costs go up. And so that's why it, despite these concerns that unions have, it is something that is rising to the forefront of their minds in, uh, and we have the opportunity to really move people towards support for single payer healthcare. When you know, you're bargaining for your healthcare and uh, you know, as discussed in, in the opening, everybody's costs are going up and up and up. You're not able to then also bargain for wage increases, for additional retirement benefits. It, it, it takes all, all of the other gains that could be made in the workplace takes them off the table. And I'm sure Catherine will spend some time talking about this. Um, you know, what, what could you do? Um, what could you get if uh, healthcare was off of the bargaining table? And uh, so, you know, when building a coalition to support uh, single payer healthcare, it's important to identify within the, the labor movement your, uh, 
your supporters, your strong supporters, the people who will um, actively, um, you know, work with their membership to do education, to do outreach, to mobilize them. You know, and there are lots of great unions that um, will do this. It's important to be able to identify uh, the unions uh, who have more of the passive support. Uh, so the uh, passed a resolution in support of it, but haven't taken those additional steps. And then you also need to know who who's going to be uh, opposing the work that you do, and uh, so that you can, um, uh, you know, continue to engage in conversations, and uh, then um, work to neutralize that opposition. In Colorado, um, a few years ago, we had. Uh, a, a statewide single payer ballot initiative. And uh, I was at the Denver Area Labor Federation at the time and uh, remember being very frustrated because uh, after the initiative had made the ballot, that's when the org some of the organizers started coming around to uh, folks in the labor movement to ask for our support. And uh, one of their talking points was, We've been working on this for 10 years. Um, and uh, my response was, well, then why are we just now hearing from you? Um, you know, there, like, there are some problems in this bill with how it addresses um, uh, uh, multi-employer benefit plans. And uh, it's, because I, it's because they were afraid to talk up to us because of the opposition. So you have to keep talking um, to... Uh, to leaders, even if you know they're not going to be in your corner. <clears throat> the second, um, the next thing that you have to um, keep in mind is uh, be patient, you know, in trying to set up meetings, um, uh, trying to uh, get to know folks, have or have the opportunity to um, get in front of it. Uh, it can be hard to get a hold of some of these. Uh, and I, I know that I've talked to some of the folks on the call about this, um, but again, you have to remember that the number one priority for labor leaders is going to be their members. And so with a lot of these folks, they're um, dealing with, uh, you know, individual member issues, bargaining contracts, um, working with employers, uh, you know, and then also, working on their legislative program, working on their organizing. And uh, so, uh, you know, outreach from independent, um, independent outside groups, asking them to, you know, get involved in another thing, sometimes falls to the bottom of the list every day um, on their to-do list. But my, I always say, I encourage you to just keep trying, just keep reaching out. If they don't want to hear from you um, and don't want to talk to you, they will tell you. Um, eventually, uh, but sometimes it just takes patience and perseverance to um, get the call, um, uh, get the call back. And uh, it's important to get that call back because relationship building um, is a key aspect as well. And I'm sure that you guys know that um, relationship building is the, the foundation of every organizing campaign. Uh, and that is no different when you're organizing uh, uh labor leaders and labor unions, uh, <clears throat> you, the, those relationships are going to be important because trust is going to be key um, to this issue. Uh, you know, when you have, uh, when you've fought hard at the bargaining table for the benefits that you've got, and they are um, benefits that you're, you're proud of and that your membership appreciates, it can be scary uh, it is scary to be willing to to turn that over to something else. It's the fear of the unknown. And uh, so uh, trust is key in that. But then also under um, through that relationship building, you'll be able to get a sense of uh, an individual uh, an individual self-interest. And uh, self-interest gets a bad rap, I think, you know, we don't we don't we don't want to think of ourselves as self-interested. But when we're talking about organizing, uh, really being able to hone in and key 
in on somebody's self-interest is uh, very important. And so what is motivating that labor leader? You know, what is on, on their, on the forefront of their mind and, uh, you know, digging into and getting an understanding of, you know, issues that might be coming up in bargaining for their contract. Um, you know, what, um, uh, what type of political education they're doing with their members already, what, what they're wanting to do um, with their members through political education and engagement, what bills are they work, are they prioritizing? Uh, really understanding that self-interest and then being able to find a way to um, support their um, ongoing uh, you know, campaigns or legislative efforts, as well as uh, identifying ways to um, uh, Make sure that your work um, with uh, single payer advocacy is in line with um, and can piggyback onto their self interest is important as well. And then, um, uh, you know, once you have that, have built those relationships, have uh, um, done, uh, you know, done the work to identify the the self interest. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's when you have the opportunity, ideally, to be able to get in front of members, do some education. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Catherine from DJDI, uh, that's her bread and butter. Um, and uh, so, uh, but it, it, it takes getting um, through those barriers first before you can get into members. And it's critically important to not put yourself in a place where you are seen as um, circumventing or undermining leadership to try to, uh, to try to get to um, the rank and file membership. That's a great way to blow up relationships um, uh, for years. And uh, <clears throat> Then finally, just make it easy to engage, but you know, this um, uh, it, uh, and it, is not any different for uh, for unions. It needs to be easy to engage in your campaign, easy to get involved, um, uh, you know, fun and uh, and needs to be act uh, you know actions that also make a difference. We want to keep the ball moving forward in some ways, even though we're in this long haul fight. Um, uh, you know, the decades long fight. Now you want to be able to see some, some minor tangible wins along the way. So that is, uh, that's my uh, brief summary of how to uh, engage with the labor movement. Uh, it is a, it's a tough job, but uh, like I started with, uh, and it's the reason I am in the role I am, we will not, we will not get single payer healthcare without the help and without the engagement, meaningful engagement of the American labor movement. And so uh, at every level um, of, you know, local level, regional, national level, we need to be engaging unions, engaging their members, their leaders um, in this fight. And so I, I thank you all for being interested in that and um, dedicated to this work. Thank you, Rhiannon. Um, I think next it makes sense that we go with Catherine Isaac, um, and then we can hear about the ideal world from Canada from Katha last. So Catherine. Okay, thank you, Deb. Um, I, I also want to, it, it's great to be here with you all today. I, I want to thank Deb Silverstein and Dr. Jonathan Ross for inviting me. Um, again, uh, my name is Catherine Isaac. I'm the executive director of the Debs Jones Douglas Institute which is named for labor champions, Eugene Debs, Mother Jones, and Frederick Douglass. And we are working to build support for Medicare for All in the labor movement. I got my start in the labor movement with the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union and our fight to build a labor party, which of course, span leaders Jerry Gordon and Barbara Walden were deeply involved. Nice to see you today, Barbara. Um, more recently, as Deb mentioned, I work for the American Postal Workers Union on postal banking and had the pleasure of working with Deb here in Cleveland. So it's a pleasure to be back in Cleveland, if only virtually. Um, hope to see you all in person sometime soon. Um, so today what I want to do is look at two things. And I'm going to 
Um, I'm going to put up some slides. So let me take a minute to share my screen. Okay. So today what we're going to do is look at how Medicare for All is going to impact workers in the healthcare industry and look at why our movement must be prepared to fight for a just transition for those workers. So the public discussion on jobs and Medicare for All is kind of all over the place. Opponents of Medicare for All call it a job killer. Some advocates of Medicare for All counter that expanded coverage will create more jobs in the delivery of healthcare, more doctors and nurses, for example. Other advocates claim that Medicare for All would not result in a net decrease in jobs because of the boost to the overall economy that will, that will come. But our movement also makes the case that it is the administrative savings from eliminating private insurance that allows us to cover everyone. In order to claim those savings, we have to face the fact that that means job loss. We can't have it both ways. I'd like to talk today about the danger of painting too rosy a picture of job creation. Opponents to Medicare for All stand ready to use fear mongering to pit workers against it, much like Joe Biden did in the presidential primary. Instead, advocates of Medicare for All must acknowledge the impact on jobs and must fight for a robust just transition for impacted workers. So let's turn to what job loss might look like under Medicare for All. I'm gonna use the assumptions from the 2018 economic analysis of Medicare for All from the University of Massachusetts, Perry. It's a really solid place to begin our discussion. As, as all of you know, um, the premise of Medicare for All is that we're gonna save a ton of money by cutting out the administrative billing and record keeping of thousands of different insurance companies. Overall, insurance administration will fall by an estimated 58%. And that means the elimination of most private health insurance jobs, a 65% decline in clerical staff at health service providers. Economist Robert Polin says, the savings don't come out of the sky. Uh, the way we save money is through administrative simplicity. That means layoffs. There's just no way around it. Sorry, my clicker doesn't seem to be working. Okay, so what is that? What does that look like um, in terms of who those workers are? Uh, the UMass Perry study estimates that 1.8 million workers could lose their jobs under Medicare for All. That's 800,000 uh, jobs in the health insurance industry and another million jobs in healthcare delivery, doctor's offices, clinics, hospitals, and so forth. Uh, so in the insurance industry, these jobs are in sales, financial analysis, accounting, administration, and they're pretty good jobs. The average wage is $70,000. Just over half are uh, women and 27% people of color and 56% of these job holders have college degrees. In healthcare delivery though, in the doctor's offices, clinics and hospitals, these administrative jobs are billing clerks, um, administrative support staff. These are the people who um, bill, um, you know, for doctors and hospitals, uh, all the different insurance companies. And these jobs are um, lower paid. So the average is $39,400. A whopping 92% of these jobs are held by women, 35% uh, by people of color. And the percentage of these job holders who have college degrees is about 19%. So let's take a few minutes here to think beyond these statistics. Here we are talking about a group of workers who may have considerable difficulty moving to new work. These jobs are relatively low wage and, and as you see, held predominantly by women and, and by people of color. So imagine you're a worker in your 50s 
and you're about to lose your job because Medicare for all has passed. You're without the benefit of a college degree. If you're lucky, you have a union job and you qualify for a pension. If not, you need to work until age 67 to qualify for your maximum social security benefits. You may be taking care of elderly parents or helping to raise grandchildren and relocation isn't really a possibility. You face a job market now flooded with other workers just like you. And you may face age discrimination on top of it. Although we know that's, that's against the law, but happens every day. So what are the remedies in place right now for uh, folks in this country who lose their job? Well, I think the pandemic made, I'm sure all of us already knew this, but I think the pandemic made it clear to lots of Americans that unemployment insurance is, is not enough. On average, it's $380 a week. It replaces uh, only 40% of wages and lasts only about six months, depending on, on where you live. This is a quote from uh, Jack Metzger, who's a retired professor the, on job training, which is another solution that's often touted as a solution to job loss. The American system of training is an ill-coordinated mess about which workers are highly and rightly cynical. So today's federal job training programs are a radical departure from what you might think about as job training. Uh, current programs are not the Works Progress Administration. They aren't CETA. Uh, those programs created public sector jobs and considered govern government to be the employer of last resort. Instead of providing, uh, but those types of programs were eliminated, uh, no surprise, during the Reagan administration. And instead of providing jobs, the purpose of job training programs today, in the words of George H.W. Bush, is to, quote, give workers constant hope in a changing world, end quote. Rather than focus on skills, these programs focus on concepts like job readiness, work ethic, and I kid you not, attitude training. But most importantly, job training is completely worthless if we're training for jobs that do not exist. These provisions also do little or nothing for communities impacted by a lower tax base um, when there's a large uh, uh, segment of the workforce that becomes unemployed. So what are we advocating? Well, we're advocating a just transition. And what do we mean by that? We mean a response to job displacement as a result of government policy, such as deregulation, trade deals, and environmental protections. Uh, impacted communities should be served as well as individual workers. And this concept of just transition has its origins in the labor movement. Tony Mizaki and the Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers Union first developed the idea of a fund we called it the super fund for workers to support workers in toxic industries whose jobs were being displaced. Today, of course, the term is widely used in the climate change movement, but it's often seen by workers as an empty promise. So let's talk a minute about that skepticism and how our opponents use it against us. I don't know if you guys uh, are familiar with this quote or remember it from the 2016 presidential election. We're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. It was Hillary Clinton. Um, ironically, she was announcing a $30 billion aid package to coal communities. But uh, because workers uh, are deeply cynical about government promises, Trump and the right wing media were able to amplify the clip and Clinton suffered political backlash as a result. And this cynicism is real. Workers can point to a string of broken promises from corporations and from our government. Consider the millions of jobs lost to trade deals like NAFTA. Now, in case you think that Joe Biden did, didn't get in on some of this action, here's what he said to encourage coal miners uh, to learn to code as a transition away from coal mining. Anybody who can go down 300 to 3,000 feet in a mine sure in hell can learn to program as well. 
So here's an important point from Sarah Nelson, president of the Flight Attendants Union and a strong supporter of Medicare for All. It's important that we not write off workers in their communities and say they just have to get over it. Labor has never seen an actual just transition, so there's zero trust. So what might a robust uh, just transition look like? It would include wage and benefit replacement for a specified number of years, guarantees that our pension funds would still be there when we need them, um, educational benefits, including college tuition, job creation, and even a job guarantee. And it would leave no worker or community in any worse position. That concept of any worse position uh, comes from a rich history of employee protections in railway labor going back more than 100 years. If a railroad benefited from a merger, for example, it had to share the gains uh, with workers who are disrupted and leave workers in no worse position. The New York Dock Agreement, for example, guarantees six years of wage replacement. And these protections are guaranteed in union contracts and in legislation. But rail labor um, leaders tell me that they've never seen a worker who believes that they're going to get that money until they actually get the check. There's that, there's that worker cynicism again. And of course, um, the Green New Deal, as proposed by Bernie Sanders, has a robust just transition in it. Uh, it includes uh, creation of 20 million jobs, five years of wage replacement, health care, and pension benefits, four-year college education or vocational job training, and economic development investment in impacted communities. So where are we now? Oops, go back to the House bill. So where are we now in our Medicare for All movement with uh, Just Transition? There is language in both the House and the Senate bills. Uh, the bill that was just introduced last month in the House by Representative Jayapal, that's HR 1976, as I'm sure you all know, uh, does have language for, as, as they call it, temporary worker assistance. Um, it, is, it calls for at least 1% of the total healthcare budget um, to be allocated to that kind of assistance. Um, and it includes uh, wage replacement, uh, retirement benefits, job training and placement, preferential hiring, and education benefits. And uh, the Dev Jones Ethics Institute, as well as the Labor Campaign for Single Payer, have been working with Representative Jayapal. We strengthened the language a bit this time around um, and, and are quite happy about that and think that this is not a bad placeholder um, for language that will come later. Now, the Senate bill, um, surprisingly, since Bernie's been so good on uh, other stuff, I don't know what is wrong with my clicker. I apologize. There we go. So the um, Senate bill also has just transition language, but only calls for up to 1% of the budget being allocated uh, to such programs. Is 1% even enough, 1% of our total healthcare budget? Um, we have a modest proposal in that UMass Perry study, and they estimate that this very modest proposal would cost more than 2% of our total healthcare budget. That would, that would include wage replacement until age 65 for any worker who's over 60 at the time Medicare for All is implemented. They call that a glide path to retirement. Um, there would be one year of wage replacement for everyone else, one year of job training support, um, which we're skeptical about, and some relocation support. But um, we need to you know, we need to decide how much is enough and, and we think 1% is not enough. So the Deaf Jones Douglas Institute has been over the last couple of years doing workshops with union members. And we talk a lot about um, 
the workshops are on Medicare for All, and we talk a lot about uh, the impact on jobs and what the labor movement should be doing um, to support a just transition. And these are some of the comments that we've gotten from union members once they realize that this is a significant issue with Medicare for All. So the other side will use job loss to generate fear. Do we want 1.8 million taxpayers or 1.8 million unemployed workers? We should be generous because we are the ones putting them out of work. And what kind of union would we be if we don't demand fair compensation? So to conclude, Medicare for all will cost jobs. Workers and the labor movement need to be front and center in defining a just transition. And it makes sense for our movement to get in front of this issue, to set the terms of debate, of debate so it isn't used by our opponents. Paying lip service to job loss with vague promises of job training will not work. We need to advocate as a movement for a robust just transition for impacted workers. It's not just the right thing to do, it's imperative if we want to win. Thank you. With that, I will unshare my screen and pass it back to Deb. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and so now in an ideal world, as in Canada, we're gonna hear uh, what it's like in Canada um, with the national healthcare system and the unions. Katha? Thanks very much, Deb. And before I start, I just wanna congratulate you all on your uh, election of Joe Biden, uh, President Joe Biden. We were, uh, I can tell you in Canada, it was a bit of a national pastime for us watching watching uh, politics in the US. So uh, uh, we were very pleased to see that and and, and particularly happy for you all. So uh, just wanted to, to say that. Um, I, I guess just I'll start with a little bit about Unifor because people may not um, understand our union. Uh, we were formerly, I was a CAW member, but a nurse. Uh, we joined CAW 20 years ago. Um, uh, we used to be a part of the UAW and in uh, 2013, we, we merged with the Communications, Energy and Paper Workers Union uh, to become Unifor. Uh, Unifor represents 20 different sectors of the economy and we're the largest private sector union in Canada, but, but we also represent about, about uh, one in three members is actually a public sector worker. Uh, so we do have a, a, a healthcare workers, education workers, um, and other various uh, healthcare workers, transit, um, and other things. So among the sectors that we represent workers is transportation, aerospace, auto, general manufacturing, uh, media workers, uh, hospitality and gaming workers. Uh, there's, there's really 20 different sectors. And of course, one of them is, is healthcare that, that I come out of. Um, uh, I really, you know, it was very interesting listening to, to the two presenters, but in particular talking about the just transition issue, because, um, you know, this comes up in, in sectors from, uh, you know, across the union. I mean, there are sectors that just, just happen to go the way of the blockbuster and, you know, there's, there's not much that you can, you can do about it. And we can see that, I mean, we've eliminated coal in Ontario, probably, uh, 15 years ago, um, and you know, uh, we don't have uh, smog warning days anymore. They're they're very rare. Where they used to be, you know, 60 or 70 days a year, uh, those have virtually been eliminated. Uh, and, and of course, there was transition processes. And uh, you know, one of the interesting things about being involved in a multi-sector union is what we can do to help with transition. Um, is is actually. Uh, you know where some industries are growing and some industries aren't. We can we can arrange um, you know work out agreements with employers for actual uh, preferential hiring for members that may be losing their job in one particular industry. So uh, just just really a thought on that. Um, but anyways, I I, I do want to get back to to. Uh, 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 what I wanted to talk about. And of course, I'm really familiar with healthcare. We've had uh, the Canada Health Act, which covers hospital care and doctor care uh, for most of my life. I don't remember, I don't remember life before Medicare. And um, it, it's something that, that Canadians hold pretty 
dear to them. Uh, they are they are really comfortable with the fact that the judge and the janitor get the same health care when they walk in through the hospital doors. Um, they like to know that their neighbors are covered. They like to know that you know it, it is a it is a social safety net that that people uh, really really are attached to. And in fact, it's political suicide for any 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 party in Canada to to run on try, talking about uh, eliminating our uh, our healthcare system, our public healthcare system. Now uh, that doesn't mean that there's not some hole, uh, holes in, in, in it. I, I mean, we don't, uh, you know, uh, we don't cover pharmacare nationally. We've been fighting for a pharmacare program for well over a decade. We don't, d- dental care isn't covered and other care like um, we would call them paramedicals, but, uh, uh, you know, physiotherapy or chiropractor or massage therapy, all of these other things are usually, uh, you know, you have to uh, have separate coverage for that. So, uh, you know, we're not perfect. Um, and the biggest example of us being not perfect is actually long-term care. Um, much of our long-term care industry in Canada is privatized. And uh, during the pandemic, Canada had one of the worst records of deaths uh, per capita of, of any of the G20 countries. Um, and that's really solely attributed to the long-term care sector where we we failed completely. And in particular, the for-profit operators failed uh, utterly failed where we, you know, we had, um, you know, literally thousands of, of deaths in, in Canada in our long-term care homes and mostly in the for-profit sector who, who uh, were motivated with, with just plain and simple greed um, and, and not the, the best interest of their employees. We, we lost in Ontario, we lost 20 healthcare workers for COVID, many of them in the long-term care sector. Uh, two of our, our members, our personal support workers uh, passed from, from COVID. So, you know, we, we felt the effects of it. Um, but again, uh, you know, there is, there is a growing movement in Canada right now to say, let's get rid of the for-profit sector. We need to get rid of the for-profit long-term care. Uh, and there's, there's many advocacy groups uh, fighting for that uh, as well right now. So we're really sort of turning the tide on this. We've got the Ontario government has committed to minimum standards, uh, not quickly enough. Uh, uh, our Ontario government's been a bit of a failure, um, uh, uh, overall in our COVID, that's probably why we're still in lockdown, but um, another story for another day. Um, I, I, I am vaccinated, so really, really grateful about that. I've had my first dose, but we're not, uh, we're certainly not as far along as you are uh, in the pro- procurement of vaccines. So uh, hopefully we'll be catching up in, in uh, weeks or a couple of months. Uh, but I do want to talk, of course, I think what, what you wanted me to talk about was, was bargaining and bargaining power. And because we have, have health care, um, and, and I guess the biggest comparison I could, I could give it to is, is our still our fight for a pharma care program. And, you know, we talk about this with our, um, you know, the fight for pharma care and getting our, our members to understand the fight for pharma care and how important it is. Uh, because many of our members, of course, we've negotiated a, a drug plan for. They have coverage uh, for that, uh, for PharmaCare. Um, but to get them to understand the need for a national PharmaCare program is sometimes just as simple as having them look around their own own families. I mean, you know, uh, Deb, when you talked about the cost of your health care, it, it, it's, a, it's a little shocking to me. But um, you know, everybody will have examples. Uh, you know, Canada has a far higher unionization rate. We, we're probably covering closer to 30% of, of Canadian workers are unionized. Um, but for those of us, you know, we all have, um, you know, whether it's a child that doesn't have a drug plan, whether it's a neighbor that doesn't have a drug plan. And, and you, you know, you sort of, we try to, we really consider ourselves a social union. And, and um, you know, I, I mean, that's sort of part of this, this process where we get our members to actually endorse our union fighting for a pharmacare plan is almost unanimous because people understand it and people understand that, um, you know, they, when their neighbors do better, they do better as well. Everybody does better. And so we, we just really try to, to make it a social issue. Um, you know, we've had uh, governments committing to a pharmacare plan. We haven't seen the implementation of it. The last federal budget last week actually um, is is 
uh, announced a, a child, a national child care strategy. So uh, a, a plan that will uh, eventually lead to to uh, ten dollar a day daycare for for workers. So you know other things that that we fight for as a social union as well. Um, but again, the, it leaves you you know it leaves you so much to bargain. I, I mean, quite frankly. Um, you know, we have employers that also say, if we didn't have the cost of this pharmacare plan, we could do better in other areas. Um, and it, as far as, you know, why workers join a union, um, you know, we've had, even through COVID, we've had some good successes in, in, uh, in organizing. And um, I think that, you know, when we talk to workers, I actually just met with a number of workers that, that in a nursing home that joined our union. And, you know, I, I mean, I think that, you know, wages and benefits are one thing that, that workers want, but, you know, I, I almost always find out it's about respect in the workplace. Workers, workers want to feel respected. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, that, that is, that is really important. I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think that having single payer Medicare would would actually uh, decrease your power at all. It would actually increase your bargaining power at the table uh, to be able to to give those resources and put them somewhere else. Um, and and uh, you know, I just uh, I really congratulate you on your work. I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. Um, I know. Uh, a num I used to live in Windsor, Ontario, which was across from Detroit. And uh, when Obama was first elected and talking about single payer, I was invited to a labor council in Detroit to, to talk about uh, uh, single payer health care. And um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of myths about, about things that possibly happened in Canada with our health care system. But, uh, but again, you know, we feel, we'll feel, we feel good about it. Canadians feel good about it. Um, my my uh, my my mother's a snowbird. My well, my father too. He just passed last year. But my mom uh, uh, goes to Florida. She's been going for thirty years, and I go down and visit pretty regularly. And, and one of her neighbors, Nancy, said to me at one point. She said we were talking about healthcare, and she said, "I know you don't think we have healthcare for everybody in the U.S." She said, "But we do." She said, "You just have to pay for it." <laughs> That's kind of not the point, but but. Uh, uh, you know, just sort of some of the interesting conversations I've had around around uh, healthcare uh, with some American neighbors of my parents. So, uh, uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And solidarity, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Katha. Um, I'm I'm going to follow up a little bit. Um, how do we get? I'm going to follow up and start the discussion with you, Katha. How do we get over the quality of care argument? Because we often hear anytime that that we start progressing towards single payer, or it's it's talked about here, we hear how bad your service is compared to what we have in in the United States, and how many people and how many Canadians come across the border because they can't get the health care. Um, which I know is not fact, but um, how do we how do we overcome that? Well, let, I mean, let's just be realistic. People with the means and people who are rich will go wherever they want to for healthcare. I mean, I remember Farrah Fawcett going to Germany for treatment for her cancer. This is uh, this is what rich people will will do. But um, most of us most of us aren't rich. Most, I, I, I mean, I I can't I can't even imagine. Uh, you know, and I. I guess my experience would be, you know, when I lived in Windsor, which was a border city, you know, there'd be advertisements all the time in the newspaper and on the radio stations, come to America and get your CAT scan tonight. You know, there, there, you know, you just, you, you can get the, and it'll only cost you $1,200 or whatever the amount. Um, but, you know, the funny thing is uh, people would do that, go and get the, the CAT scan, but when, if, if it actually did find something, they were running back to Canada for their treatment because they just couldn't afford it. Um, you know, I have to say that that our Canadian healthcare system, our hospital system, rarely fails anyone. And, I, and this is from working in it for, for 20 years. I mean, I worked in a rural hospital, but I remember when the Americans would come in and 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 just, you know, top of their mind was was how do we how do I pay for this? And top of our mind was just fixing whatever it was that was wrong with you. It was it was about priorities. And um, you know, I mean, I get that people 
we, we pride ourselves on, on the right care at the right time and what people need. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, if you if you go into a hospital with chest pain, believe me, or, you know, a, a, an urgent matter, you will be treated. But but, you know, we understand um, that people will always want to pay their way to the front of the line. And 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 it's you know, it's just it, it, it's it's not always necessary care, right? This is this is the reality is that we want, you know, we want things to progress as they should. Um, you know, if I needed a, an ultrasound in, in Ontario, uh, my doctor decided I would, I needed an ultrasound on something or a CAT scan, I'd probably have that appointment within a week. It may take a little longer if, if it wasn't an urgent matter or maybe it's a follow-up. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's about getting the care you need when you need it. And, and um, I mean, everybody would want to be front of the line and people who are rich can be, that's, that's the reality. And then another question for you is, is someone asked why you're having an issue getting the vaccinations in Canada? Now, that's a, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, we, we uh, gave up. Uh, we used to domestically produce vaccines in Canada and uh, under a conservative government a number of years ago, our vaccine capacity disappeared. Um, so it's just uh, we're simply in a process of, of uh just procure, procurement and, uh, you know, with the race with all of the other countries, I, um, uh, you know, there's been uh, many delays and shipments and Moderna and Pfizer and, and um, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just been a challenge. And, and again, you know, when you're not producing these things as we weren't, you know, we, we, you know, we're now making in 95s in Canada, but that was a, that was a big transition, right? We just, we just weren't prepared. We, you know, the manufacturing capacity of many of it, uh, like in the U S as well has been shipped off, but, but um, uh, uh, we, we aren't uh, able, I mean, I think we're going to see that change. I think that, you know, within a couple of months, our, our doses will be up, but, but we could have, I mean, you know, listen, my mother and my brother in Florida were, were vaccinated uh, long before they would have been vaccinated in Canada uh, a few months ago. Um, but um, uh, yeah, we could have done better. And I, I can't necessarily explain it, except domestic produ production isn't, uh, isn't really possible anymore. Thank you. And switching gears a bit, now I'm going to ask Catherine, um, first of all, people want to know if you'll share your slides. And then secondly, um, has Pramila Jayapal seen your slides? Uh, no, um, but, but we have worked with her and her staff. Um, but it's something we, you know, we really need to stay vigilant on. This is something that just always gets watered down in the, in the final product. So um, I'll say that. And then for all of our panelists, um, there's a question, isn't for-profit and quality healthcare in the same breath a contradiction of terms? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that. Katha, Rihanna, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, the comment is entirely correct, yes. <laughs> the, um, uh, you know, talked about it in removing, um, uh, uh, drug uh, prescription drug or integrating prescription drugs into the nationalized plan in uh, Canada. And that, you know, that's exactly what we need to be doing uh, here is decommodifying healthcare. Because um, when healthcare is a commodity, um, uh, it's impossible for everyone to get the service that they need unless you're one of those people who can pay your way to. Uh, the front of the line or pay your way to the to the top tier services. Thank you. Um, so here's another question from the chat. In HR 1976, the Hyde Amendment is repealed. How do you deal with that argument? And I'm assuming everyone knows what the Hyde Amendment is. Um, Kathy, if you, it, probably for you, I don't know that you know what the Hyde Amendment is. It, um, it, it makes late term abortions illegal. Yeah, you know, um, in the trainings that, that we've been doing, the workshops we've been doing, um, we, um, I actually prefer to be doing trainings with people who aren't convinced that Medicare for All is a good idea, right? Um, 
We know that about a th at least a third of union members in the United States voted for Trump. Um, there's a lot of hostility toward government being able to do anything right. And this, this actually doesn't come up that often, but when we have these things that are, um, you know, for some folks, this is a moral issue. Um, you know, we, what we do is we have workers um, talk it out amongst themselves and, and see if they can come to the conclusion that, um, that the benefit of having Medicare for all um, outweighs some of these things. The other, the other big issue that comes up is, you know, we, that some people think that immigrants shouldn't get health care. And, you know, we just have folks kind of walk through, walk back from that assertion and, and try to employ the, um, the, the lens of solidarity, right? And uh, that this is, uh, if you're gonna have something good, it needs to cover everybody. And, and abortion is a healthcare issue and, um, you know, it needs to be covered. So, you know, it, it may be an issue that keeps some people from supporting Medicare for all. And we just need to face that fact and, and find folks for whom it won't. Would anyone else, either of you like to weigh in? Okay. In Colorado, what we um, almost every other year, we have abortion bans that um, get put on the ballot. And, uh, and I'm, I'm based in Denver right now. So, uh, Colorado is familiar to me and what we're, and what's happening there. And, uh, the labor movement usually, um, uh, you know, joins up with other groups to oppose these bans. And there's leaders every, every time who, um, are nervous about talking to their members about it. But, you know, my, in my experience, similar to Catherine, you just, um, uh, kind of set, set the framework for um, for members and let them talk it uh, talk it out themselves but also framing it as a fundamentally like worker issue is um, uh, where we overcome some of the um, uh, some of the consternation that people might have um, it, it, because you can't build power in your workplace if you don't have the power to control your own body is is the framing that we use and how we think about it a lot so um, it's how I've talked about it in worker spaces before um, uh, and, uh, you know, might be successful framing it in that lens when it comes up in worker spaces related to Medicare for all. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, why did Jayapal remove the ban and conversion for the for-profit hospitals that was in the earlier single payer bill, HR 676? Well, I think she removed it because she was um, trying to appeal to a large segment of the population that believes it should be removed, right? So, and that this is an opportunity to do it um, and that and that it would do more good in terms of uh, garnering support for Medicare for all than, than harm. Um, I don't, I don't know the, um, I don't know her thought on the um, for-profit hospital conversion. And then this question is for Katha. At Canada has abortion on demand, correct? Um, and do you know the rate of abortion in Canada versus the U.S.? Um, well, I guess I, I, we, you know, we consider abortion, uh, you know, a decision that's made with a woman and her doctor, and uh, we don't involve ourselves in that. I don't think I, I don't know the rates specifically, but but abortion is covered. Um, there is a growing a growing um, anti-choice movement in in Canada um, that we see, and and they they uh, get into politics every once in a while, and you know usually some through some private members bill, but it's generally generally defeated. And then also for you, Katha, we know that Black and Brown people suffer healthcare discrimination in the U.S. Does that happen in Canada? Yes, I, I can't say that the that we're, we're uh, immune from from discrimination. It, it certainly does happen. Um, you know, we we have we have issues, uh, of course, and we're we're seeing the disparity right now when we look at 
um, why we're we're still in lockdown in Ontario, um, and it's because uh, essential workers are still, you know, um, well, our premier has has shut down many things. He hasn't shut down, um, you know, the warehouses and the places, you know, the the uh, food packaging industries and all of these industries where, uh, you know, many new Canadians and many racialized workers are working, um, and uh, you know, this is this is obviously, you know. Uh, you know, there's a whole medical community that's up in arms and really bringing this to the forefront because they see the patients that they're they're caring for with COVID and where they're getting it. And they're not getting it because they went to a party. They're getting it because they went to the meat packaging plant or the Amazon plant or, or you know, that, you know, one of these. And so there is some level of discrimination involved in that, I, I think. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I, I mean, I guess we would have to say that we're not immune from it. It, it can happen in our healthcare system as well. One of our members, a uh, personal support worker um, that, that died of COVID uh, last in the first wave last April um, uh, was a, a, a worker of color and uh, he did go to the emergency department and, you know, of course nobody was let in and, uh, and was sent home with an antibiotic and, and died at home uh, a day later. And, you know, you, you do always have to wonder if, if there's some level of discrimination um, in that as well. Uh, uh, you know, we try to be better. We, we've actually, our union has been putting on webinars uh, talking about uh, discrimination in healthcare and how, how our healthcare members can, can, you know, avoid that. And also, of course, for our Indigenous uh, Canadians as well. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any other questions? You can raise your hand. Okay, we do have a question from Dennis. Are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, good. I was in touch with our one of our very strong leaders in the STIRS, the Ohio Teachers uh, Retirement Group. And I was stunned to hear a number that uh, makes me wonder if we have some power and leverage in the world of unions. The number is that Ohio stirs, and we have to verify this number is real, spends $90 million per day in addition to what stirs members pay in to health care. Now, this is a stunning number, $90 million. If that's true, the STIRS, the teacher's retirement system, would completely change their picture. If members knew that $90 million was being spent on healthcare by STIRS, this is retired teachers, per day, that would, I think, stun the entire retirement systems, um, both PERS and other systems and trickle into the union world in a very powerful way. Can you, can somebody comment on whether this is a, a real number, whether this is um, a leverage point uh, and, and, and run through a little bit of math as to what this means? Yeah. Um, one comment okay. on STIRS, they take in um, 3.5 billion a year. They give out 7.5 billion a year. So STIRS, Ohio STIRS is actually in a money loss situation. They've had to give up their cost of living lately, as an example. This 90 million a day would completely reverse any losses to the tune of 20 two billion dollars a year so i'm i'm just puzzling this number out i wonder if anybody else has heard of these values and whether it become a powerful leverage point for unions um, thank you dennis yeah dennis i can answer some of that first of all i would want to um verify the um the cost the the number that you got there and stuff and um, one of the things I can tell you is that um, STRS, which is State Teachers Retirement System, and it's a state plan that they have for um, teachers in Ohio. Um, a number of years ago, Alice Frina and I met with uh, bean counters for the healthcare plan. One of the things that they told us 
was that they were spending, um, you know, basically if they had 100,000 retirees, uh, about 25% uh, of them were pre-Medicare, non-Medicare for healthcare. The other 75% was on Medicare and they were spending 75% of their healthcare dollars on the 25% that didn't have Medicare and only 25% on the 75% that did. And as we went through that conversation and Alice will remember this, you know, they started out with, well, we're not in favor of what you want. We said, well, that's okay. We're here to find out what you think you need. And that, but by the end of the conversation, the one guy said, well, I never thought I'd say this, but we really do need Medicare for all. Um, you know, because when they realized that, well, then what we did is we started to see a change in how SDRS was supporting benefits and they started to remove their support for, for non-Medicare recipients and put it all behind Medicare. So um, their Medicare plans became ba um, better um, as far as the coverage with uh, a very low deductible and very low coinsurance rate. And the only time I meet my deductible is if I have a, sh uh, a surgery or something. Whereas the, the support for the non-Medicare, that became an almost, um, that it is a really horrible barbaric policy that they have out there with high deductibles, high coinsurance, high co-pays. And maybe that's a good thing because they're um, indoctrinating people about how horrible uh, corporate and commercial insurance is versus Medicare. So, um, you know, from that standpoint. Now, I would like to see us verify that $90 million a day figure. Um, and so we'll need to go, you know, to the people that, that know and see if they will actually give us that, that figure. So, Any reaction from our panelists? Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, that is one of the sort of intricate things, um, you know, sort of as Rhiannon was talking about, unions have a huge burden on their backs, right, to, to negotiate uh, for-profit health insurance. Um, uh, the number, the percentage of retirees who still have uh, health coverage from their employer has declined massively over the last 20, 30 years, right? Um, and even in bargaining, uh, younger workers get angry that the union is negotiating the retiree benefits, you know, that are so freaking expensive, right? So solidarity gets uh, gets weakened um, with that. So I think that goes back to Katha's point too about how taking healthcare off the bargaining table can really strengthen our unions rather than than weaken them. Um, I don't have any idea about the actual numbers there, but. Um, that age group of retired, but not yet eligible for Medicare. Oh my gosh, right? That is expensive. Um, and you know, one possible incremental approach to Medicare for all is to lower the age of Medicare eligibility. So if we went to 55, that would immediately um, benefit those unions that are, are paying through the nose for those retirees. I would just comment on the retiree issue as well. When I say we're fighting for a pharmacare program, um, I would also say that that um, uh, pe in most provinces in Canada, people over 65 actually do have a pharmacare program. And so we, we have, you know, the government sponsored um, plans that, that actually uh, the federal government is the largest purchaser of, of uh, pharmaceuticals almost, almost anywhere. Um, and, um, with that power, and I noticed there was a question in the chat, why do people come to Canada for their drugs? Um, because, because our purchasing power often makes the prices significantly lower because the federal government is such a large purchaser of, of pharmaceuticals. And in fact, um, you know, covering every Canadian would actually give us more power and lower those costs even further. And we have another question from Logan Martinez. Logan. Uh, I'd like to maybe brainstorm with folks here. Uh, there are certain unions nationally who've taken a lead on, on uh, Medicare for All. And uh, I think one of the things that we could do as a group is to figure out, you know, if we can get some working relationship with them here in Ohio. 
And, and if you know if the panelists or you <laughs> have any idea how that could happen. Panelists want to take a crack at that? Yeah, uh, I think you know that that is the the best place to start when you're you're wanting to build a coalition is to um, uh, you know find the find the folks who are in your corner, right? Um, it's one of the things I mentioned. So some of the the major leaders, uh, you know, you're going to have NNU, <clears throat> APWU, UE. Um, uh, those are the folks um, uh, who really take uh, this issue and uh, um, uh, make it their number one issue. And it's it's not number five, six, seven, eight um, issue on their on their list of things that they care about. And uh, so then identifying those locals and finding ways to get involved because they're going to be more likely to be supporters as well because they're getting that, that education and encouragement from, from, their, uh, from their local union, or I'm sorry, from their national union. Um, and so uh, you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, getting those folks involved. And I, I think that that work is already being done locally. Um, uh, I can't speak to what it is uh, is being done locally right now, but I believe it. I believe that is. I think Span has been driving efforts. Correct. Yeah, we're we're working on it. I just wanted mm -hmm. to sort of help strengthen the networking of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm happy to, you know, happy to spend some time offline doing, uh, you know, some uh, some power mapping um, uh, and, uh, you know, find uh, identifying locals that it makes sense to reach out to. Um, another good place to go is to uh, central labor councils um, and area labor federations. Talk to those folks it's a it's a good place to identify identify your allies and um, identify leaders who who want to be engaged who might not necessarily um, uh, uh, make the list of you know priority unions but because um, they're they're national or the regional isn't involved but um, uh, you know they individually are involved and would like their union to be Another question from the chat um, for our two, probably our two U.S. panelists. Um, are unions still able to, or are they able to negotiate Cadillac plans in the in contract negotiations? Uh, yes, uh, the they still do, and they can. Um, and the Cadillac, uh, the tax on Cadillac plans uh, was repealed before it ever went into effect. So another question, great discussion. Have you also linked with the, the League of Women Voters US to capture more letter writers? Because the League of Women Voters supports Medicare for All. That is a state organization we haven't. We've been trying to work with um, local and state League of Women Voters, but um, going to the national would be good. That's a good idea, thank you. Any other questions? Deb, this Go is- Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I couldn't find my hand raiser thing. Um, so I just read an article by Bernie Sanders very recently um, and Michael, um, you know, formerly California nurses uh, about uh, how important it is to push for and, and that there are possibilities of expanding and improving Medicare right now as not only to help people right now, but to help lay the groundwork for Medicare for all. And I wonder to what extent that strategy is being looked at and, uh, and pursued by the Medicare for all forces. And what's really, uh, yeah, that there might really uh, be a possibility of some of that uh, getting through. Yeah, I would say that um, right now it, it's a top priority because, um, uh, you know, there are very few incremental goals that I feel the, the Medicare for All movement has, um, uh, you know, a path for that actually 
make a significant difference, but this is one of them. Uh, one of the most important things, though, will be to expand the services that Medicaid provide, Medicare provides, um, as well as lowering the age, because, you know, just lowering the age, um, you know, is going to continue what we already do in our healthcare and have done in our um, pandemic response for healthcare, and that's just be a boon for the private um, uh, insurance industry. <clears throat> and so if we can uh, uh, improve Medicare, make sure it covers a lot of the service, the basic services that you now need Medicare Advantage for, then um, it, it's a great step in laying the groundwork. And so it's, it's been a top priority um, for a lot of folks working in these, in these spaces. And it, it's really exciting. But I have one last question for Rhiannon. Is it possible that the labor campaign can do a, um, a checklist for those of us that are not in labor, but are in the single payer movement on important things to remember when talking with unions about this issue? You know, it would be helpful to have that in front of me when I go into a meeting. Um, yeah. And that, so. I think that's a great idea. And then, uh, you know, maybe just a, also a, a key on different acronyms. Uh, you, when you start working with labor, you very quickly um, are in acronym hell. So right, right. Um, a little cheat sheet might be good too. Yeah, and include their definition of the Taft-Hartley plans because most of us don't know. I mean, I know what they are from talking to Jim McGee but, um, right. and, and that type of thing. Um, I, and that is a tricky one. And yeah. I, I found out labor unions aren't sure that you're really concerned about that issue. And that's a big one yeah. for multi-employer yeah. um, you know, laborers, so. Exactly. That's a great idea. I'm happy to have you work on that and get something over. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, how are we gonna pay for this? And the answer they give them was, we're already paying for it. We need to be a little more specific than that when we're talking to people about it. Yes, it's going to involve taxes. You need to be honest about it and, and you need to be forthright. And uh, I think one of the <laughs> things we can do is understand how it's yeah. going to affect ta taxes and out-of-pocket expenses. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. That's a, that, I think that's the other really big barrier. Um, you know, people are afraid of that. And um, we, we've been doing some work with, with union members on that, on that issue as well. Of course, there is no one set financing plan, um, but that paper from, the, from UMass Perry uh, is a really good start. If it's, uh -huh. it's a heavy lift, but it's uh, a really good indication of how much it will cost, what the savings will be, and then how we might raise the money to do it. So I would highly recommend that. And um, we, do, we do a workshop on that issue too, so. Oh, great. Yeah, the, the UE has uh, a worksheet that they uh, use and they like like to distribute so that other people can use as well. But it's a it's a little just a worksheet where folks can calculate how much money um, they spend on health care, whether through premiums, co-pays, um, uh, you know, all of the different costs that uh, get thrown in there in one way or another. Um, uh, calculate it as a percentage of their salary then and compare it to some of the different uh, funding proposals and the tax structures, like how they would be taxed. And um, uh, it's uh, very enlightening. And so I'm happy to, to send that along as well. So we've got one more. That's it. One more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. D. Chavez. I just thought of this um, for Katha Fortier. Um, what do you have an idea or some kind of um, um, <clears throat> PowerPoint that shows what people pay in taxes in Canada for, for their health care, for their Medicare for all? <clears throat> you know, I don't have anything on hand, but I, I will look around. I, I know we've done a lot of work with our, uh, we, have, we have sort of a North American solidarity project and we work quite closely with UE and the National Nurses Union on projects. I think I'll, I'll, I'll talk to our research people, but I, I you know, um, and I know it's been done in the past. There's certainly been uh, some comparisons um, 
uh, the one that usually is the most effective is it, it and, and it's probably the one that's a few years old in my head, but it may have been updated. So uh, Canada spends per capita about $4,000 for healthcare for every Canadian, whereas what's spent in the United States is more than three times that amount. And then that's an, an older statistic, but it, it, you know, it, it doesn't matter who's paying for it. It's, it's somebody is paying for it eventually. And, and, you know, most of it's going to profit. So I'll, I'll look for that and I'll send it along to Deb, whatever I can find. Great. Um, you know, keep in mind that no matter who's paying for it, who writes the actual check, it's all coming out of your pocket anyways, whether right. they call it taxes, uh, premium, deductible, copay, coinsurance. Um, and also it's from reduced wages if your employer is providing it for you. So it really all comes out of your pocket. So I think we're ready to wrap here, Deb. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask everybody to please put save the date on your calendars. On July 24th, we will be doing a presentation with Dr. Paul Song from California on the false promise of a public option. And he will also be um, happy to discuss any other healthcare proposals that have been introduced into Congress um, other than the single payer ones, you know, the distractor um, bills. Uh, also, um, Paul, um, Paul is a radiation oncologist, one of those rare specialists that support single payer. Um, and he's also the president of PNHP California and an excellent presenter. So we will be getting the, um, link out soon to register for that one. We hope that you'll all join us for that. And then also October 30th is um, our, will be our next one. We are scheduled to meet at the Quest Center in Columbus. We've been putting that off as far as we can for the pandemic. And whether or not we can do that is gonna depend on where we are with the pandemic. <coughs> it's safe to meet um, and that, but this is our 20th um, anniversary year. and in November, SPAN will celebrate 20 years in existence. Um, not only is that a milestone to stay in existence that long, but um, it also tells us it's time to get really serious and get this job done. And like I said at the beginning, we can't do that until we have that critical mass of active supporters in the state so that our elected officials know we can make a difference despite what they do to try and make it difficult for us. So we will be getting out more information. I wanna say thank you to our presenters today. This has been really excellent, um, all three of you. I, I think that you know it is really important for us to pay attention to what Catherine Isaac had to say and be able to answer questions honestly to people that, that um, you know, have those questions and to give the information as far as we know it. This is what we'll fight for, but unless you're with us, we can't guarantee it'll be in the final bill. And that's a big issue. Yeah. So thank you to Rhiannon, thank you to Katha, thank you to Catherine. You've made this a really excellent presentation. Thank you for Deb Klein for um, being our moderator. You really moved everything along so well and so professionally that um, maybe we'll hire you to do all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Deb. <laughs>